There's always been something strangely cool about bass scales, as J.S. Bach found out, although I don't think he knew just quite how cool this little number would turn out to be. The pure graceful beauty of this air owes much to its slowly descending major scale bass line. Seemingly the only moving object while the other instruments hover and glide like kites above it. A bass effect that has been copied a thousand times. The downward stepping major scale though isn't the only scale in town. There's another more saucy scale and it's called the chromatic. The chromatic scale opens up all sorts of new possibilities, especially when it comes to the effect that the bass line will have on the chords above it. Because the chromatic scale naturally triggers a more sophisticated and ambiguous set of accompanying chords, its mood is darker. In the next part, the basses roll in musical misery. composer Henry Purcell knew a thing or two about tension, anxiety and desperation. As a young lad living in central London, he witnessed first the plague and then the great fire of London. Perhaps not surprisingly, his most famous work features untimely death. In his 1689 opera Dido and Aeneas, Queen Dido, abandoned by her lover Aeneas, decides to build herself a funeral pyre and throw herself onto it. A very desperate housewife, it would seem. To provide her with appropriately suicidal music, Purcell first of all sets up a chromatically descending bass line. The whole song is then based on this bass phrase repeated ten times. A recurring bass phrase like this used to be called a ground bass. Just about every rock and roll and boogie woogie bass line that ever existed is also, in effect, a ground bass. It's just that no one ever bothers to call it that anymore. You'd think, wouldn't you, that a piece made up solely of ten repeated bass phrases would get a bit boring. But here's the clever bit. Purcell lets the bass phrase go on repeating, but he changes the chords above it all the way through. Meanwhile, Dido's tune goes off on a completely separate journey all of its own. What this does is it makes the whole death thing seem inevitable, with its sad, descending, chromatic bass line going on and on without faltering.
Purcell's ground bass in Dido's Lament may seem stylistically like it belongs to a long forgotten era, the time of Christopher Wren and Samuel Pepys, but you can find the exact same technique in use nearly 300 years later in the hands of the mighty Stevie Wonder. The album is fulfilling this first finale, the subject matter is life after death, and the song is They Won't Go When I Go. Stevie's ground bass, like Purcell's, is simple enough. And also like Purcell, he gradually adds chords to the bass line, and the melody line has a life of its own. The walking bass can do happy and it can do sad, but bass has another trick up its sleeve and it's one of the simplest and most effective of them all. So far we've seen how composers from many different traditions have taken the root note of a chord, its tonic, and used it as the bass line. But as chords became widespread in the late Middle Ages, another option presented itself. That was to have a note other than the tonic in the bass. So if your chord was a simple C major triad, C, E, G, you could have a tonic, naturally, C at the bottom, but you could also have the E in the bass, and you could have the G in the bass. This technique is called inversion. You'd think, wouldn't you, that just by changing which note of the triad was in the bass, it wouldn't have that much of an oral effect, but you'd be wrong because weirdly, inversions sound like new chords. It's a kind of an optical illusion in sound. Now, I'm going to play a little chord sequence using the default option of just having the tonic or the root in the bass. Now what I'm going to do is take each chord and halfway through it, make it into an inversion of itself, and it should start to sound quite different. 